The HROs who use AI will replace the ones that don't. Like that is definitely going to happen. It's a huge source of power for you as an individual and as a team and as a company. You kind of owe it to the business. You're doing your job if you lean in and be curious. Someone very clever and famous many years ago said, you know, coined the phrase that all disruption comes with fear. You know, we don't know this because we weren't born then, but when they first introduced the car, they had people on street corners shooting rifles in the air to warn the pedestrians that there was this car traveling at 20 kilometers an hour that was coming. <laughs> I think AI, uh, you know, the media have done a great job. There are legitimate reasons to be concerned um, and people need to be really scrutinous and you know there is growing regulation in this space. Bob welcome to the show how are you? I am pretty damn good. Nice to see you it's um it's always a pleasure to see people in um in person. I feel like we don't do it enough these days now. As uh, well. I agree. There's an energy that comes from being in the same room with someone. Yeah, and people are probably people are probably catching the accent as well. So you're not from London. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm from Australia. Um, yeah, so I am. I'm a bit of a nomad at the moment. Um, probably that'll become clear later. Yeah. But uh, yeah, in the UK, I thought it was spring, but I got to tell you, it doesn't feel like spring. No, it's always like this. Just rain, 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 and that's that's about it. So where are you? Where are you based? now <sighs> on a plane <laughs> <laughs> you're like you're like in effect, true story yeah on a plane and i think the one piece of advice i want everyone to take away from this <laughs> interview is never fly from la to london that is the worst that's a long jet lag yeah. go from new york to london so tip for the audience what's so you dwell like what's so you saying la to new york new york to london yeah You'd want, Sounds crazy. It, I would rather do that. It's worth the stop off. It is worth it. I mean, who really? doesn't want to stop off in New York anyway? To be fair, we we all of our events that we do are in New York. We've never done the long one yet to, to there. So I'll, it's 12 hours, right? I can't Too even long. remember. I'm trying to put You're it in the spaghetti. Me. Shane's trying to get, <laughs> Shane, my co-founder Shane's trying to convince me to do a, a, a lot of trips out there. So now I'm like, it's quite a long one. Yeah. And not as long as Australia. I'm about to jump on a plane for 21 hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. But oh, it's right. great to be here. So when you're not on a plane, where are you? Melbourne, Australia. Nice, nice. But work's taking you all over the world. It is. I mean, it is. But uh, that's exciting. Um, but I miss my, I miss my puppy. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to going home. Yeah. Tell everyone a little more about your background and the journey to to where we are now. Well, I mean, it's it's. I'm keeping most of it to myself because I'm going to sell the rights later when I oh, retire. Okay. It is quite a frigging story to how I landed here, but the short story you're is- You're serious about that, I can tell. I really am, Okay, yeah. you have a joke, I was like, oh, was, <laughs> to, are you, okay, you're dead um, serious about Yeah, that. so look, this is my fifth career, um, being a founder and CEO. Um, I've never been a founder and a CEO before, so it's my first time at that. I've been doing it now since 2018. I started my career as a lawyer and decided pretty quickly that it wasn't going to be enough for me. I've heard that so many times. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Can I say it is the best degree to do for what I'm doing right now? Because firstly, if you're in HR, there are a lot of illegal issues that come up. But in the world of AI, it's so important that you understand the governance that's required when you're using AI, privacy mm -hmm. uh, laws. And, it, you know, you're obviously engaging in MSA negotiations. So it, it's been absolutely necessary, I would say, almost for what I'm doing now. So I did law. Went into an MBA and decided to shift into management consulting at BCG and worked there for five years, 10 years actually, but in between I had three kids and got to a point where I really didn't want to do the travel anymore. And so I was moved into or offered the chance to be head of HR for BCG APAC. Mm -hmm. And from there was uh, recruited into the CHR role of um, the REA group. REA group is mostly owned by News. It's really the cash cow for News Corp. Okay. Um, a really interesting digital business. And I was hired by um, the former CEO of Microsoft APAC, Tracy Fellows, a Canadian, who is a really incredible person. I learned a lot from her. And um, that was my first stint in, in, a, in a sort of a digital environment. And then my experience at both organizations really led me to build this because I could see that people are the most important thing for most companies, even though they're not on your balance sheet, but the tax of actually bringing them in um, and the cost of that, um, particularly the opportunity cost of so many hours being spent by people leaders hiring, which means you're not going to deliver you know, effectively what the business needs. Um, and then the bias that holds us back from seeing talent um, because you know mirror hiring is a real thing yeah so I just figured there had to be a better way and also fundamentally I think that the human experience of going through that was not very human yeah 100% what what was the moment for you that you were like okay now I'm gonna go set up this company and tell a little bit more about the company actually the, the name of the company and 
and the work you're doing now? Yeah, so sapia.ai, um, which is a combination of two really important thematics to our product. One is the homo sapien, the human. How do you put the human at the center of everything you think about building? Mm -hmm. um, and the other is obviously AI. And uh, you know, how did I come to this? It really was from seeing the lack of solutions to a really systemic problem. Um, the inefficiency, the productivity suck or tax on people, um, the limiting factor of humans being the ones that drive that process and make the decisions along the way. I, I had no idea what AI was. You know, at the time <laughs> I introduced Workday and CultureAmp and they were both seen as really leading edge technologies yeah. for the time. And, you know, ironically, as CHROs who might be listening to this, I'm sure they receive 20 EDMs a day from people touting, you know, products uh, that are AI based. I never received one. Like it just didn't exist. Um, it certainly existed before um, generative AI, you know, somehow the world has seemed to, you know, have woken up to the power of AI and it obviously existed a long time before that. And uh, so I managed to convince another mad person, because you have to be mad to be in a startup, you really do. Yeah. Um, it's your whole life, you know, it, relentlessness, it just takes on a whole new meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have a family, I have a puppy, but really I feel like I'm married to the job and that's because it is the best job I've ever had. It's incredibly creative when you're working in tech. Yeah. And, and you know, he was from CultureAmp, he was the chief data scientist. Well, he, he built the data science team there and we just made a couple of bets. We just thought if we could figure out how to hire people, you know, assess, interview, coach, through a really beautiful experience that people trusted, um, you know, that's the ultimate outcome. How are we gonna do it? Well, we decided that chat was the medium through which people will live and engage and even then, there were books like Sleeping With This Smartphone, you know, and you could see with my kids who are now teenagers, 20s, that everything in their life is, is through the smartphone or through the phone. Um, and I don't know what the latest rates are of, of ownership, but pretty much it's ubiquitous. It's only going up, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, my daughter's upstairs and she'll text me. Yeah, she, she won't come down Easy the stairs. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then Booty, to his credit, could see that language has a lot of signal. When he was at Culture Ramp, the real insight about the culture was in the verbatim not in the scoring and I don't know if they're doing anything with it now Sorry. so you know when you do an engagement survey mm -hmm. and they say why tell me why you know mm -hmm. describe how you feel that's when you really learn the tone the culture the vibe when people are filling out a multi-choice questionnaire there's not a lot of richness in that there isn't a lot of data but at that time even I think Google had 10,000 people working in the space of NLP that was before BERT was produced and, and deployed by Google because they were the obvious you know the early innovators in the space and uh, he could see that language was rich in signal. If you think about us as humans, our whole life is about communication. And you're inferring so many things about me from what I'm saying mm -hmm. and how I structure my, my story. And we thought, well, could we do that? Could we use language? And language is also, if, if you source it from the right place, it's very pure. If, and particularly if there's no personal, personal PII in it. And so we experimented and it took us two years to build the product and the most important investment is the time to collect, uh, create the data set. So the problem with a lot of AI today is that it's built on third party data, i.e. resumes, i.e. social media, or human data, which is even worse. And so you cannot control for bias. And so people legitimately should be worried about any AI that is using third party data. You know, when it comes to Gen AI, I would say by all means experiment with it and play with it and use it to give you a productivity gain on any part of HR that doesn't involve people decisions. Yeah. So, you know, you can go to um, Gen AI and say, write me a learning and development program for this. But if you're using it to create job descriptions, I think that's very risky because you've got to remember that all of that data is from us and we're biased. Yeah. Uh, I, I was smiling because I was thinking about something that happened last night. Like my, uh, my daughter did a drawing and she asked me if I could animate the character. And we, I'm not going to say the AI platforms, but I was using a couple of AI platforms. I think that's a safe use case. Um, but my, but my, um, my, my wife's black and my daughter's mixed race. And it kept making her white. Mm. Even though we... Did you use Gemini? Because you know they've run into we, challenges we with that recently. We uploaded a photo of Robin. Mm. Her actual photo. And it still kept making mm. her white. Every time. Mm. Even when I was prompting it, it kept the hair. And, and only when I really... <laughs> I wrote a really strong mm. um, mm. Yeah, um, prompt did it actually get mm. correct mm. I was like, oh, and it just me and my, my wife and I were just both of me like wow okay wow like mm. really mm. is biased mm. uh, well there you're using it to really create something 
Mm. And that's, or evaluated is the other area, you know, which is very different to say, I'm giving you all this data, you know, all of our engagement survey results, summarize it for me and give me advice. And that's a pretty, that's a fantastic use case for mm-hmm. it. You know, what's the risk from that? Um, really, very little. Uh, if you want to search as a CHRO, you know, tell me which are the best CRMs or how do I make an informed decision about CRMs? And it'll come back. It may have, we've tested this for us against our competitors and it's not perfect. But the best thing about it is it helps organize your framework. And often that's where people don't put enough time in. Is it, what are we trying to solve for by using this technology? And so it helps you build almost the start of a business case around that. And uh, so I think there are many in HR and in organizations, it's it's definitely going to displace a bunch of roles. Yeah. But it's also going to create space for people to move into a more elevated, you know, job. And uh, so, I, I, you know, the biggest blocker I find is people's fear of their job going. But actually, you know, you, you're evolving to a whole new, like a, a Maslow's hierarchy, a whole new level of, of self-actualization when you're starting to rid yourself of, you know, resume screening and can't believe how many people are sucked up in phone screening. Um yeah. And imagine what your life will be like then. You know, you'll be spending more time in the business and that's a much more rewarding place to be. Even today, Tom, my um, chief marketing officer, we, we, we were hiring for a new role and we were going through <laughs> resumes on LinkedIn that he'd shortlisted. And I was like, why are we still sitting here spending two hours doing this? Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, yes, we have to do it. But I was like, LinkedIn's a pretty powerful solution. when you. <laughs> and I'm sitting here like, okay, it's shortlisted based on very generic criteria and and um, filters, but I'm like, we're still spending hours and hours and hours and hours of time. So Look, I think the really important, like my advice to you would be, what are you looking for? Like, what is your culture? What is your DNA? I think we overemphasize or overweight expertise. And there's plenty of academic research that says that past performance does not in any way predict the future. Mm-hmm. And, you know, think of all the undiscovered talent that's out there that could be great because they don't call themselves a marketer and marketing today is so different to what it was five years ago we was having that same conversation yeah and, I, and some of the people we have spoke to it was very outdated traditional marketing not my I, he said to me chris what you think marketing is isn't what yeah and i was like oh and I, I, when i explained my what i think marketing was and then he explained it we were mm. so far apart mm. yeah I was like, oh wow okay that's already we already we already we've made a mistake already we like we're not even putting the right details out there ourselves yeah um yeah. as well we're excluding all those people that you're talking about mm. that don't have mm. those traditional well like i'm a good example of this which is it turns out that i'm really good at sales i'm either selling to vcs to raise money or selling to prospective talent mm-hmm. to convince them to come on this mad journey or maybe having conversations with chros but no one would hire me in a sales role today i've got no sales on my resume i had no idea that i was someone who really loved that journey that you go on. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, I I could have had a very different career to what I've had because I had no idea that that was something that I was good at and no one would see me as potential in that space. So I I just think as early in your career as possible, you know, as a 22 year old, 23, if you can know yourself and then think in a much more creative way, you know, where can I apply those strengths? If I'm someone that loves ambiguity or I love hustle or I'm really competitive, like what doors does that open? And I, I think back to, the days when I did law in those days everyone went for a discipline you know my parents were get a get a degree and go into a, a discipline but that doesn't exist anymore and you're closing your mind to so many other spaces that you could explore by pigeonholing yourself into yeah. a function I feel I was quite lucky in that sense that like I never I never went to school mm. so I got a job at uh, 16 and to help my my mom was a single parent with four kids so I had no choice but to get a job so I never really put myself in a box I just was like, I need to do whatever jobs are, uh, is whatever necessary to pay the bills, right? And I got to be a chef for a couple of years, and I got to work in a for as an assistant to a judge in a high court in in London Bridge. <coughs> I got to taste like loads of different things, and then when I got into sales, I was like, oh, I love this. The competitive nature of it, the fact that like it's the first time I ever fell in love with learning because I was like I was realizing the more I was learning, the more deals I was closing. I had a little post that note that said, "The more you learn, the more you earn." <laughs> on my on my uh, PC monitor, and I became obsessed. It's the first time I truly fell in love with with learning because I could see how it was impacting my life and my mom and my brothers and sisters. And um, I feel like being an entrepreneur is the ultimate version of that mm. you're constantly mm. there's never there's always something that i'm having to yeah. learn and grow with yeah. like my friends always say my mom says this to me all the time growing up she's like you never stick to one thing chris you get really good at it 
and then you stop once you've mastered it. I'm like, that's why. Because for me, it's the journey to get really mm. good at it. I love, you know, I always use the skateboard analogy because I used to skateboard. Like I literally would have to fall over a thousand times before I land that trick. And when I land it, it's almost like, oh, what's next? <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That, that's yeah. kind of how I feel about it. Yeah, um, a, a kind of an impatience to go on to the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. And Shane's the same. We, we, I found we're very lucky. We, you know, we've known each other since we were six years old. Somehow we're still part of each other <laughs> as founders. And he has a similar mindset. And we kind of both push each other to be better. Mm. And it's mm. very rare, I think, as a friends you can do mm. that and run a mm. company. I think that combination of learning and problem solving, you know, I, I've hired a lot of salespeople. Some have not worked out. That is really the combination that has in the HR space, I think you really need because you want to learn about you, that you're not selling the product. It's like, tell me about you. What matters to you? Mm -hmm. What would success look like in 12 months? What would your boss have to see for you to be like, wow, this person is incredible. You know, you're getting a promotion, you're getting a raise. And that endless curiosity about your world, your challenges, um, where you're at in your career combined with the ability to then try and problem solve. You're, you're not talking product, you're not talking your technology. I think that's just so critical. Like I don't like being sold to, but I'm always open to a conversation <laughs> where someone can help me think through a problem or they're a useful sounding board. And so for me, you know, I'm the best salesman in the company, but that's because I'm not a salesperson. You know, I, I'm, I'm just really same. curious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just, I am think I'm the same. I, I, I've had actually, even uh, one of my coaches was like, you need to stop selling. Like, why do you keep selling? You need to you know, focus on being a CEO and panel. Like, no, no, no. No. You're always the primary seller as yeah, the CEO like, of a startup. Yeah, I'm like no, like uh, you know, and also I love it. So I, uh, and but to your point, it's more of a conversation. It's more curiosity. You know, I literally just had a, a call uh, with a podcast guest. It was nothing to do with a sponsorship opportunity or, or a sale. It ended up turning into a sale. I was advising him how to invest his marketing budget for the year and what would work for them as well. And it was like I was, but I genuinely wanted to help them. It was, mm. There was no mm. like if, intent of like I need I want you to work with mm. me. And just out of having those type of conversations, naturally people want to work with you and they feel like you're being genuine mm, um, mm. as well. Like uh, there's been times where I'm like, actually we're not the best fit. Yeah. And they're like, what yeah. do you mean? I'm like, I'm, this, we're not the right fit for you. Yeah. Yeah. People are so surprised. What do you mean? Because we want to spend money. We had a big H HCM company. You all know who they are. I can't say the name. They basically tried to buy the whole year of the show of the podcast. And then, wow, that would have been an attractive check to underwrite was. the year. It yeah. was, but I, but it was almost like selling my soul. Mm. Mm. You know, like this isn't the X show, mm. this is the HR leaders show. Mm. Now, like, yeah, but hey, we're going to give you X. Mm. And they were literally were like almost offended that me and Shane were like, this was an early days when mm. we really could have used the money. But I was well, like, I think, what's I don't they going to say to people? They're, they're US based, but sort of everything's for sale in the US. You know, one of the <laughs> not, yeah. analysts in that space has just come out on LinkedIn and said, you know, I feel like there's a lot of unacknowledged promotions here mm. that 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 sort of I wouldn't say corrupt but probably should be disclosed yeah um, and uh, you know and I and I really admire him for doing that because I think trust in HR is the most important quality to build in your culture and a trustful culture is a culture that people want to be in and they want to exceed their own expectations and they want to talk about to their friends and I, I think there's a big connection between transparency and trust yeah. Particularly AI is one space, by the way, where the regulation is going there. If you can't provide explainability to, on what is actually going on here, what are the inputs, what are the outputs, what's happening along the way, from an EU AI Act perspective, you won't be compliant because they've already said that AI in the context of employment is an area that's, that's a high risk one. And so how do you, you know, you, you don't want to tick a box, right? You want to actually create a fundamental culture and value set and you know, principles that all rely on trust. And so in the days of COVID, when people were scraping or monitoring behavior um, based on technology use to see whether or not you were working, I, I honestly find that really abhorrent. Um, we and about that a lot, yeah. yeah. It's, it's just, uh, my wife had a software on her computer. She works for a large finance company, which we won't mention. And uh, every half an hour it timed out. Mm. So basically if you didn't press a key, it showed you're not working mm. and she was so stressed yeah. we have a little we have a young daughter yeah and there was times is where, she still working there no she's <laughs> there you go but there was a time where we were in the car and we was gonna get some food for robin because there's no food in the house and i had her laptop on my lap and I, she was like can you just press that every five minutes 
and I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're going to have food. This is ridiculous. Like this is the and I was like, <laughs> it's like this is crazy. Yeah, that your yeah. boss and your boss and on the, on the calls they would say this many hours and you wasn't here between this hours. What were you doing? It's mm, like, mm. The opposite of trust. Yeah. So what a terrible culture. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you got to default to trust as well. Like I think assuming that people would do the right thing. You know, the other thing in HR I've always sort of riled against his policies and often policies come about because one person did something stupid punish everyone and yeah and instead of going and saying you know hey chris i just want to talk to you about that behavior everyone has to suffer from that and policies don't create compliance no one's going to read a policy no they just create i don't know barriers to really being yourself and they stop people from having the right level of management conversations they probably should be having it's like an us and them mentality yeah you put the policy between you and the uh as well um you mentioned obviously about how the product started, but now you're kind of at the intersection of, you know, AI, mm. VR, AR. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, so I probably should have been more explicit about what we've built. So <laughs> what we ended up building was a, a truly new category, yeah. um, which we call Smart Interview, which is the ability to understand people deeply through language. Yeah. So in five questions based on structured interviewing, which is a science, we can discover many different things about your personality, your competencies, your comp skills. So all of the soft skills, power skills that we all see are so important in like today's world. You added power skills there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, the alternative way to do that is a human to do an interview, which obviously people don't scale. So if you're a really large business that gets a lot of candidates coming in, how do you know that you're not missing out on someone great? The other part that's limiting is humans aren't going to call you and give you feedback unless you're you know, at the CEO suite level. And that feedback will probably be, oh, look, we love you, but you're not a culture fit, which is extremely frustrating for people. Or you can use traditional SJTs or psychometric, and I've never found those experiences to be human. So it is extremely disruptive to a lot of different sectors, to the assessment space, to RPOs, because RPOs model is all about people. And obviously we're changing where people spend their time. Um, And it is... um, uh, you know, a, a genuine innovation that no one can replicate other than maybe Amazon, because what you need is it's not so much the algorithms that are the IP, which we built, or like we're a fully vertically integrated machine learning system, it's actually the data. And the challenge with so many tools is that the data is not pure enough. It is from us. It's from social. You know, one of the experiments we ran in the very early days when we we're trying to figure out whether this was going to work is our data scientist lead scraped 2 million tweets and a lot of people on Twitter self-declare their Myers-Briggs profile. And so he wanted to see whether you could predict an element of MBTI based on your tweets. And it was highly, highly predictive. So we knew that there was signal, they call it in language. Mm-hmm. And we actually wrote a paper, which we published. At that time, Twitter was not owned by Elon Musk, but it was still quite a contentious platform. And that paper said that if you use generalist data, generalized information to build a model you will naturally create adverse impact. So people don't tweet the way that they apply for a job, right? No one's going to use that kind of language. And Twitter is not representative of the the whole community. So you're you're feeding it in on two fronts. And I think people don't think hard enough in HR. Like if there's one thing that you do is you be extremely scrutinous about the data. And, uh, you know, companies that are building machine learning models based on surveying an incumbent group and then HR saying, these are the good ones, these are the bad ones. Can you, you know, build a model based on the good one? You're just embedding your existing bias because for sure you've been biased in how you've hired and you also can't explain it and you have to provide explainability you know in in, in this world so i think so that's the science it is peer-reviewed published leading journals like we're always presenting and not me obviously the really smart ones in our team <laughs> are doing that but what's really been game changing is and i remember when we pressed the button and first tested it is i always felt like well, well why don't i get something out of this like what's in it for me and I want to learn. And people have this insatiable desire to learn about themselves. When you like, say you, you mean the candidate? The candidate. Okay. And, um, and I want to feel heard. I want to feel understood. And so we took the insights, the understanding we have about the individual, and we created a way to provide insights on their personality and coaching. And this is all randomized. It's based on you know reviews by IO Sykes. And when we first built it, we only had one version, right? Um, and we tested it and, and everyone on the team was terrified. I still remember being, in, it was literally a garage and going, we've just got to do this, we've got to do this because it was so radical. No one creates automated feedback, right? People are terrified about it. And the first customer to go live was Qantas and Qantas has been with us wow. for five years and 
a pretty conservative organization and they just felt so passionately that their candidates are their customers and so you know we said look we can always turn it off if we get a lot of feedback as we ask feedback and people go this is ridiculous this is bullshit this is in me i don't trust it but it is absolutely the winning feature of our product like now we're, you know it, other businesses are starting to do that but the other part that almost created our culture is obviously you know in the beginning i used to see every bit of feedback that would come into my feet and it, would, it was just phenomenal how much people value knowing themselves and to have that insight to go, I'm now going to go in an interview with you and I, I can express who I am. You know, a lot of people don't know themselves and they don't know how to share that. Yeah. yeah. And we're saying it in a really human way. So, you know, we use language like if someone was really high in humility would be, you know, your voice deserves to be heard. Make sure that you, you know, you speak your mind, right? Like everyone's voice deserves. So it's in a very nurturing way and the funniest feedback you know my mum's they, always they said this to me in, by the way what's that do they know they're going to get that going in they do it's like a surprise they do they do i think transparency is important so how, yeah. how do you position how do you present that to them on the way so in? the way it's presented you know whether we're in a uh, an hras or not is look um we believe everyone should be given an interview we want everyone to be given a fair chance so this is blind and untimed which is how we really impact on those who identify with a disability and great it's super valuable for neurodiverse and a lot of people don't want this they don't want to sit across from you. They're terrified. Yeah. Um, it's astonishing to me how many people get really scared, even by human to human. Um, and then it also says, and the best bit is that you're going to learn from this. We want to honor your time and you'll receive something just for your eyes only, which invites you to I love that. know yourself. And uh, and we hope that you'll value that, you know, learning is growth. Did you measure the um, the uh, the increase in the amount of people that actually went through the process after you changed that? Uh, so I don't remember what it was before because it was something I pushed really aggressively within the team. Like you've got the science team yeah. who are deeply conservative and then you've got me who's like, fuck it, let's do it. You yeah, know, yeah, see what okay. happens, right? We can just turn it off the next I mean, day. Like the increase in completion. Of, of well, we're about 92%. Wow. So that's pretty unusual for, you know, we don't call it an assessment, by the way. It, we, it, it is a structured interview. Um, so we call it an interview. Assessment also has like a baggage attached to it as well. Like there's, there's yeah. yeah, it's not, yeah. it needs a rebrand. <laughs> Agree. <laughs> it needs a rebrand <laughs> as well. So what, just like very simply, what is the process they're going through? What are they doing? So you'll probably live in a workday or success factors environment and yeah. almost immediately it'll come up and say, look, either you'll click on a link or they'll send a link and it's no, you, you know, you don't have to download anything as a candidate and you start this journey. And so let's say Joe and the Juice, who's just gone live and for them, you know, they have a challenge on turnover because people don't realize it's a really tough job, right? Mm -hmm. You're cleaning, you're on your feet. Um, and so part of what we're doing is we're creating an opportunity for you to learn about the organization, almost communicate to you. So Chris, here's a video, really brings to life what our people feel, what makes this job amazing and what makes it tough. And so no one's gonna read a position description or a JD. I think they're a waste of time. If I was you, I'd just like Not delete engaging. them all. But the chat, you know, it's visual, it's obviously branded, it's, uh, we track how many people watch the videos, people love to learn. When you're doing it in more specialized roles, you'll have hiring managers with videos and saying, I'd love you to come and work for me. This is who I am. So you're feeling like you're having a conversation and eventually we'll add a generative component to that. Then you'll go through the questions. The company has the option to ask any other questions, like do you have working rights? The idea being that you're only asking the candidate to do one thing. Right, you're not making them go through five different steps and you don't need any phone screens. And then the final step, which is optional, is look, we really care about diversity. We'd love it if you could share how you identify. Now, that has been amazing. 98% of people will share that. When we first started to do that, which I don't think is anywhere what you get in ATS, is when we first started to do that and we added disability, do you identify with a disability? People would say, yes, but I want a box to share with you what it is. People today are really comfortable to say, I'm someone with a head injury, I'm someone with dyslexia, because they want you to know how to care for them, how to support them. So that kind of blew me away, because again, HR thinks, don't ask people that, it's really uncomfortable, but we're in a different generation to they most of the HRs. They want to tell, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they yeah. want to express themselves, they want to be heard, they want to be understood. Um, and then within about five, 10 minutes, everyone, every single person, whether it's a million or 500,000, will get back this report that says, learning is growth, you know, we want you to use this to help you in your career. And we capture feedback from the chat, capture feedback from the, what we call the, the my insights, my yeah. insights. And it is something like 99% positive sentiment on the chat. People are, wow, this is really cool. It was really easy. The obvious things you can imagine. I mean, anything's better than the current state of how you apply for a job. So in some ways, the only way is up. And the feedback on the personalized insights is sometimes just so moving, 
so funny. Like I read this to my mum and she said, I've been telling you that for 20 years. And this is kind of like, you know, wow, this sort of aha they moment. That, they get that regardless whether they're looking exactly. forward with, to the next stage or not. Exactly. And then what the company gets is we're matching you to the profile of success. Now, something really important for anyone interested in AI is you don't want to be starting with machine learning models. You want what's called rule-based models. The rules are, what are you looking for? I'm looking for someone who's high, medium, low on these things. And it's not truth. It's an assumption of what success is. But the important thing is that the company decides and it's a great way to engage the organization on the change journey. So you have to get your business leaders in to say, what Joe and the Juice did, we actually used our tool to crowdsource from their hiring managers. What do you think makes a great juicer? Because they know. Yeah, yeah they know. <laughs> and if you just roll down a tool to, it's not gonna, you're not going to get great adoption. No. And that forms the basis. It creates transparency. And then the organization gets a match score. But more importantly, they get what we call a new resume. They get this deep profile that says, very easy cognitively to digest, strengths and weaknesses, a bit of a flavor of the person, their interview responses. Um, and uh, so that is, the, I guess, the critical document intelligence that they rely on. Mm-hmm. But you, there's no video involved? We have added video, unfortunately. I'm not a fan of video, okay. even though we've got it. So we add it onto the end. So if you think Optical. about a funnel, yeah. Optical. So some companies want to look at the video because there's this, you know, even though COVID destroyed the bias that I need to see you to trust you to do the work, so that's except what, for the case of your wife. So the reason people wanted it is the reason you don't want it. It's because it's basically allowing companies to still creep into that habit. Well, if we've removed all bias by adding it in, at the, adding it at in the beginning, the you're adding it in at the end. Yeah. You're, re, you're creating risk. I never thought about but, that. But we have a, an amazing set of insights. This is what most CHROs are sort of gobsmacked by, is that we can track your applicant diversity, race, gender, et cetera. We then show you what the machine is doing. And then we show you what your people are doing. So you, you now have visibility of, oh, you know, Chris and his team, he seems to be hiring less than his fair share of, you know, people of a certain group. And Barb over here is doing a frigging awesome job. I'm going to go and chat to Chris and find out why. So transparency creates accountability. So now you know where this is happening within your organization. And that is, that is the power. Yeah. And you've got the data right there. Yeah. It's super clear. Interesting. So, uh, okay. Because a lot of companies I see are going video heavy in your space well you certainly can't use video ai anymore not since regulation came out a few years ago in the us you can't use video ai i mean facial recognition is 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 basically illegal in many states in the us yeah because you can't explain it so if there's a video that's observing all this stuff about you it's going to be reading all it's highly predictive which is really wild Mm -hmm. um but you can't explain what it's looking at and and it's been shown to be heavily biased in terms of how it processes a bit like what you experienced with your wife and child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I just want to share one thing because we're, we're at NVIDIA next week. NVIDIA has this conference, 60,000 people. Mm-hmm. They're like crazy these day conferences. Yeah. I'm not going out. Our data science team is going our labs team. And we're launching what I think is the massively disruptive technology, which is we've taken Llama, which is from Meta, yeah. um, and we have fine-tuned it. Now, building large language models yourself is extremely Why expensive. Why did you use them, by the way? So, sorry to interrupt you. Um, purely from the dimension around accuracy um, fairness. Okay. Um, you know, we tested Claude from Anthropic. We obviously tested Bard. And look, I'm a huge admirer of Jan LeCun. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I think I think he's a high integrity, obviously brilliant. I feel almost embarrassed to be even saying that because how am I to judge someone like that? Um, but uh, that was a decision made by our ethics team internally. And if you build your own, own language model, just to give you an idea of the order of magnitude costs, right? Building your own LLM is like maybe... $84,000 per, let's say, 1,000 tokens, $84,000. Fine-tuning a large language model is $1,000. So we can't afford, and most companies couldn't afford in the HR tech space to build your own LLMs. Having said that, we have around cheating. So we can detect if you're cheating, right, from ChatGBT. But so what we're launching is this tool that is the ultimate, it, it interviews, it evaluates, it scores, it explains, and it coaches. So if you think about traditional competency frameworks or anything where you're trying to understand people and they're trying to understand themselves and everyone learns at a very deep level, we've built that. So why would you ever invest in a talent management system again? Because anything which enables both parties to get better intelligence is better than just one. Mm -hmm. It's presented through a natural language interface. So instead of getting a deep report that someone at Corn Ferry has written and it's costed a lot, you're going to get this in your hand. And so my vision for the company is that we are giving everyone on the planet 
their own personalized AI career chat oh, chatbot. And you know, we've we've sort of explored how do we get this in the hands of students? How do we get universities to use it? They're all just frigging too conservative, mm. um, and not really a, a bastion of, of innovation. Um, and you know, that to me is going to change the world. Wow. That's huge. Imagine, I can imagine like, I always get a question from younger members of the family when they leave school and be like, what do I do? Imagine them having something like that. Exactly. Something exactly. in their hands where they could have a conversation and be like, "Yeah, these are things I enjoy. What careers are going to happen? Like, oh, I mean, my kids have gone through these so, tests at school and it, it is sort of archaic. You would be, I think my daughter got, you'd be a great in events management. It's like, really? Like very specific. <laughs> I remember those kind of things. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. You don't know what you want at that time. And it's always going to change, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, to, to our point at the beginning of the conversation about your career, right? You started your career in one trajectory and it went another. Like I've done seven, I've had probably 700 plus Citroes on the show. And probably uh, we, we worked out the other day, it was like 20 something actually chose a career in HR. Yeah. Every yeah. single other one found their way there somehow as yeah. well. But yeah. having a support and guidance like that is something early on in your life or any stage of your life, to be honest, to be to give you that kind of guidance mm. is very, very, very empowering. I've got to tell you, the only reason I'm here is that, you know, we had International Women's Day the other day and, uh, you know, I, it's an amazing saying from a woman much wiser than me that that women succeed in the company of a lot of good women and a few good men. And I, I can tell you that I wasn't going to do this, but I had really great people who said, you've got to do this. Um, and what I would love is if we could unleash this sort of awareness of what I could be, you know, we have such an imbalance of money going to women and money going to any minority. And I think, a lo I think you know, some of it is obviously bias, but also, you know, I have so many young women coming to me looking for advice. You know, a girl who did a law degree and she said, I want to go and be a judge's associate. And I said, why do you want to do that? Why don't you go into sales? Like I encourage everyone to go into sales. I think it's such a great learning ground. Yeah. So how do we get more people to see themselves in a different way, you know, um, and imagine how their world would change? Yeah. Sales is a superpower, honestly, for me. Because it's it's listening, it's people, right? It's, it's understanding so people. Yeah. Yeah, like it's uh, it's got bad rap though. It's funny because whenever you tell people you're in sales, oh, you're in sales. It still has that. It still has that. Well, I think you could say self problems, because that you got to have that mindset. If your mindset is sales, reframe it. I think you're not going to get the deals. But if your mindset is I solve problems. Can I solve your problem? I wish I had that line a couple of like ten years ago when someone someone asked me what I do. I solve problems. That would yeah. be a much better reply. I mean, they'll probably think you're a wanker because it yeah, sounds no, like it a bit of a wanker thing yeah, to say. Yeah, that's a bit. Yeah, potentially. Like, oh, solve problems. <laughs> what um you mentioned uh, as being a female founder. What's the biggest challenge you face as a uh, as a female founder? I actually think it's more about me. Uh, look, I definitely think there's bias. Absolutely, there is. I just published something recently. Financial Times published something. There's clearly bias. Um, and, you know, there are men hiring men. And I mean, just look at some of the, the decisions that have been made by different VCs. But I've got to say, I just, it's taken me a long time and I ebb and flow of just the confidence to know that it's on me and that, that that's a good thing, not something to fear. And I think I had a deference for the board that was completely undeserving. I hope my board don't listen to this. They're great people, but they really have no idea what we're doing. And I, I'm the, I own it and that can feel quite scary. And uh, it just to really have the confidence to claim the space that I was in, it, it's, I, it took quite a few years. To build the confidence? Yeah. Interesting. What, what message would you give to other female founders that are early on in the journey or thinking about going on a journey having been through it. Uh, I say don't get VCs involved. <laughs> you know, look at Canva, right? Melanie Perkins is incredible. Canva, Canva is one of the most amazing. successful companies oh, in the amazing. world. Yeah. Now, you can bet that, you know, she structured their investments and so on to a point where they can't exit her. I'm sure there was a point in time at which they maybe thought Melanie couldn't do it and they needed someone else who would probably have been a male, right, Who's who's been there, done that before. And... Uh, you know, she kind of backed herself and I'm sure she made some critical decisions along the way. But if you're not reliant on anyone else and you're not needing anyone else, I think avoid getting other people involved. You know, I think there's this incredible pull and attractiveness of VCs, like all these yeah. VCs telling amazing stories. And I got $100 million at X valuation. Like how many companies then just disappear? So you know, many. Don't, don't, like, don't go for sort of, you know, vanity metrics like mm -hmm. this VC invested this much. Just focus on what you believe you need to do for the business. And uh, I think there's a lot of seduction around being connected to VCs. I would rather take money from high net worth um, any day than from a VC. 
you, you kind of sell your soul a bit. Mm. Like I don't have those kind of VCs, by the way, on my on my register. I mean, I can I tell you there are just so many crazy moments when that's why I said I'm keeping it for my, um, you know, for when I retire. But uh, I remember being in conversations with uh, in the early days, and an investor said, you know, what does your cap table look like? I said, I said, you what? Your cap table? What is that? I had no idea what it was. Yeah. And you know, I guess there was so much I didn't know. I couldn't worry about it. I'm learning all these things right now. Yeah. Then tomorrow <laughs> there were more things I didn't know. Like yeah, you, yeah. every day you're learning just an insane amount, an insane amount. You almost don't have time to be self-aware about the things that you don't know. And you just have to let yourself, it's almost like a, what is it, a trust for. And um, I think the other thing that's really important is we're, we're too much in a bubble in our business. You know, I get to meet a lot of people externally because I'm always talking but I don't think I do it enough. Um, so I, I think you've got to try and find a bit of balance and not let your whole life be sacrificed to it and realize, you know, I've always believed that innovation comes from difference. So get out, you know, speak to different types of people and completely different sectors and that it kind of gives you perspective and that's healthy. Yeah. No, I love that. I appreciate your honesty. First and foremost, not many people will be, will be that honest. And um, I feel like, some of Shane and I's success is in is in our scrappiness in a weird way. Like we didn't have a business plan. We still don't have a business plan uh, in the sense of like a traditional business plan. When I remember one of the, we met um, someone who we, we was considering investment from early days. He was like, give me your business plan. And we were like, we don't have a business plan, but we know exactly how we're going to yeah. achieve it because we've yeah. been doing it for 10 years in, in, in before for someone else. But we're, we're, we're kind of like MVP everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go throw it, like put it out there, build, build as you're, um, we're kind of like jumping out, you know, the analogy Shane always uses sort of the jumping out the airplane and building. Oh, absolutely. We're doing that. Down. Yeah. We did that for the first three years. Yeah. We're, we're still doing that. And, and also I, I, I choose to be in that, mo in that zone. Like it's, we always kind of talk about seeking discomfort and that's where the magic happens. If anything, when I get too settled and everything's going too well I'm like what's wrong <laughs> you know because that's when you realize you're not really innovating and yeah. challenging and pushing yeah. yourself there is a balance because obviously for me I've pushed that too far in the past and it's impacted my mental health and I've gone way mm. too deep down mm. there so I, this is a, just sort of a, a sweet spot yeah. in, in, in yeah. the middle to be able to yeah have and that. is your wife involved in the business as well no so but, okay. but she, which is good i think to have someone that brings you back to a different world but now she's also just started quit her job and started her own company right so that has actually created a very interesting dynamic in our yeah. relationship which we're, we're still i don't say struggling but we're we're working on mm. because that's mm. a very two entrepreneurs mm. yeah a husband mm. and wife entrepreneurs is mm. it's tough yeah it's yeah. really tough to be able to do that. And Especially with, you know, a young family. Five-year-old. Mm. Yeah, to do that. But I want her to, I'm really excited for her to go on this journey as well because mm. she sacrificed so much mm. over the last seven years for me to, to mm. do this mm. that I think it's, I'm excited for her to yeah. go and... Yeah, it will be interesting given that you're in the seat and have been for a while to just observe, does she experience something different like being female? I'm seeing interest i i've over i've listened to some of her calls because i've just seen the background mm. and the way that like she, when she's pitching and the way the things some of the things and the language that's used towards her mm. is like not degrading but like i i, I see the difference yeah i can hear the difference yeah in the way that yeah she's being spoken to if that makes yeah, sense. yeah absolutely um also as a black female leader there's almost like there's sometimes we've gone to meetings where like I can see surprise on people's faces. Mm. Oh, you're, oh, you're, you're, you're black or, mm. oh, you're, really? Oh, people like, say that? No, it sounds like the, a Larry see, David moment. No, I can see like they're surprised that, that she's the founder of the company. Right, right. Like, whether it's she's black or not, whether she's a female, mm. I can see some, an initial shock value. Well, you, Wh whatever you're that just is. describing the bias that we all have, right? And that's yeah. why we are no, really you know, bad at do it to that seeing point. the I truth. Can, yeah. Yeah. I can see it. And they're like, oh, mm. oh, oh, you're the founder. I've never had that. Yeah. No one's ever said to me, "Oh, you're the founder." Yeah, yeah. She it's like an assumption that you're entitled to that. Yeah, but as a, as a white male, mm. I don't get that. Mm. Shane had it before because he looks so young, and people are like, "Oh, you're the founder." The company because he looks yeah. like he's like 16 years yeah, old. Yeah, but that's a, that's a little bit different. Um, we've had that a lot actually over the earlier years. Is like, we, like in order to be a founder, I have to be really, really old and have grey hair. Mm. Apparently, mm. being young, mm. like even my CEO when I quit my job said who are you to quit your job and think you can start your own company and immediately tried to sue me and shane within a week oh wow I, was, that's I, awful. Thank, I gave you 10 years of my career and yeah. the reply 
if you get I think to be honest those things are motivation to be mm. honest we took that as a sign that we are mm. valued mm. <laughs> I gotta say um, you know this is probably not a good thing but I do find that uh, proving people wrong has been a real power oh, to motivate me I love it oh, if I can show you I'm gonna do this let me tell you and, something you, know? you really love about that story <laughs> about two years later they hired me and Shane to advise mm. them mm. and the f- company that purchased them they reached out to me and Shane to partner with us and mm. I was like you do realize the company you just purchased is actually currently suing us mm. right now and they were like why he was like why like I don't understand I was like literally there's no reason why like we we left and started a company they didn't like it they got mm. scared and he immediately just obviously whatever called them and said this is ridiculous why are we spending money on this and, and then up being a customer mm. of ours so that was a really cool moment to go to walk back into yeah. the office and see all those people and now they're like we're here to advise <laughs> advise you on your strategy mm, of, mm. of how you should get in front of HR executives. Yeah, yeah. Um, as well. It's an but irony. That was a fun moment. Yeah. Um, as well, <laughs> and, um, yeah, so yeah, um, we spoke a lot about AI, right? But we are starting to see some some blockers in, 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 in the market in terms of the fear and some other things. Mm. What are your thoughts and perspectives on that? So someone very clever and famous many years ago said, you know, coined the phrase that all disruption comes with fear. And, you know, we don't know this because we weren't born then, but when they first introduced the car, they had people on street corners shooting rifles in the air to warn the pedestrians that there was this car traveling at 20 kilometers an hour that was coming. <laughs> Back then, yeah. And there was a lot of fear. And when uh, I think AI, uh, you know, the media have done a great job. There are legitimate reasons to be concerned um, and people need to be really scrutinous. And, you know, there is growing regulation in this space. But I think the reality is it's not going anywhere. And, you know, there's that phrase now, the CHROs who use AI will replace the ones that don't. Like that is definitely going to happen. And it's a huge source of power for you as an individual and as a team and as a company. So you you kind of owe it to the business. You're doing your job if you lean in and be curious. And, you know, I did a session with CPOs today here in London and it was all about AI fluency. Where do you start? And, you know, the, the refrain that I'm, constantly saying is there's no such thing as an AI strategy. So if your board or your CEO is saying, what's our AI strategy? There's no such thing as an AI strategy. What there is is an AI governance strategy, which you've got to get going on like today, collaborate with your head of privacy, with legal to figure out what are the parameters, what are the principles, where are we going to encourage people to embrace it? And you can't, you can't control it. I've heard of many organizations where they're mandating, no one in the business can use general. I mean, forget it, you can't do that. So you have to help people by defining some principles so that they can self-assess, right? And, and because it's moving at such pace, like where is it safe? Where is it less safe? And put a whole lot of different examples of there. It's, it's completely safe in my view to feed all of your engagement results in terms of verbatim and say, can you summarize this and tell us what we should do? I mean, we're doing that uh, at the moment and there's Which no risk in that. Which normally take months. Yeah. Right, I remember. Yeah, people, I mean, it's oh, like it's freaky, right? How that must be it is. crazy to see, right? Well, I remember people. Oh, Chris, we're just during this period. So we've got, we're doing <laughs> survey review. It's going to be. I'll oh, get back to me in a couple of months. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah. it's so, completely so, different. So yeah, uh, and then it's it's unsafe to use it to write job descriptions because it's using the job descriptions that we've all created, you know, as people. But that's that one of the main examples everyone keeps showing. Everyone. Well, that's because it's so easy, right? But it's also very risky, mm-hmm. um, and most job descriptions are written by us. And we're biased. I mean, there's technology that exists just to de-bias it. I think the other thing is just the fear of what's this going to do to my job. And I think that's where, you know, the best way to deal with, like we had this discussion before we started, you know, what's on the other side of failure and what is on the other side of failure? There's a fantastic podcast interview between um, Tim, what's his name, that famous Tim podcast. Ferris. Yeah. And... Um, uh, Oh my goodness, this is an amazing African American um, comedian. I'll have to find it and share I've it with you. You can put it in the notes. Because I and watch show. I listen yeah, to and it's quite a few years old now. And he asked him, and he said, There's nothing on the other side of fear. What is it? What's going to happen? Are you going to die? Um, you're going to lose all your money? Um, and and it's, this, it's mental. A lot of things hold us back, are really just in our mind. And uh, I think instead of shutting it down, you, you can't do that anymore. Like our world is surrounded by AI. Um, and the, the big thing in recruitment is we're going to lose the human touch. Well, frankly, humans don't scale. And how is that, that principle serving you now? Like if I went and interviewed everyone that applied for a job, would they go, wow, it's incredible? I mean, they definitely wouldn't. So AI 
can be more human than humans. I mean, you see that with generative AI. And so almost put your assumptions to one side and then imagine, imagine like putting aside technology, imagine what a bit like what Airbnb did when they first started. Imagine what a 10 star experience would be like for a guest. And I don't know if you've ever heard that podcast. It's really brilliant. Yeah. They, mm-hmm. You know, it would be like I was the Beatles and I, everyone's at the airport. And, and so put the technology away. Don't buy tech, right? Solve really meaningful problems and be aspirational in who you want to be and how you want to turn up for your people. And then think about, is there a technology that could help us do that? I think US in particular is very overstacked. People have so much tech, but how much impact is it having? If you've invested in CRMs, are you therefore not spending any money on job boards? If not, I I think you haven't really solved a problem, right? Many companies are spending hundreds of thousands on really awful experiences on job boards. They buy CRMs so that they create these talent pools. Is it working? Um, So I, I think there's so many billions of dollars that's gone into HR tech and there's so much tech that they just end up buying tech and they lose sight of what really matters. You've got to own your space, own what matters to our business, what's going to move the needle in an order of magnitude way. Like if you're proud of the fact that you're now automating the scheduling of a million interviews, what if you halve that? What would that do for the business? What if you reduce it to a quarter of a million? Now you're starting to talk about real business value, not the automation of something that's a massive time suck. Mm. So I, I, I tend to be quite provocative because I think it's really lazy to buy tech. I think yeah. what you really want to measure yourself on, have we made a difference? Can we see that? Can we measure that? Does the business see that? Starting, yeah, it's starting with a problem. What are you trying to solve? Like, I feel like you're right. People are just buying the technology then figure it, then like- Fall in love with the problem. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I love that. Do you think this is a, a moment in time for HR leaders to harness the power of AI and lead their organizations? Into what, the- they have to, they have to. And, and, you know, we talked about HR finally gets a seat at the table with COVID. Now's your chance to get a seat at the table. So you think about a business that's got 70% turnover versus one that's got 20%. That's going to really start to impact on sales. So suddenly the one with 20% is going to race away because everyone knows that high turnover creates significant impact on revenue and it creates more high turnover. So suddenly you're actually creating you know enormous amount of white space between you and your, your nearest competitor and, and you have to be really conscious of that. Mm. rather than, you know, can we automate phone screens? Now, that might be useful because you can use those people for something else, but start with what really drives value to the business. Yeah. What do you think the role of the CHR will look like in the future as we move more and more to this AI first world? Well, I think, you know, no one at least 10 years ago joined HR to work with technology. You joined HR to work with people. Everyone would say that, yeah. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and it's about, well, there's a big risk component of your role now, managing the intersection between data, technology, and people. Um, And, you know, I almost think, I don't know if everyone in the world has revered the Netflix culture deck like I have. I think it's the last truly, before Sapia, the last truly great innovation in HR because it just changes the whole way in which you think about culture and, you know, creating a sort of a freedom in a box, the box being the principles. And so this is a moment where you've got to, you know, sort of down tools, and start really investing in understanding the business, the business strategy, what's happening in the business that's going to impact downstream. I also think that with generative AI and intelligence and chat, most of the tech tools that you invested in won't be around. Um, it makes no sense to have five different tech tools that deal with five different journeys. It, it, you know, it's not, it's not a straight line, uh, people. Um, and, uh, you know, even things like, how do you nurture alumni? If you're losing a lot of people, you know, do you invest in them when they've left? Because people, people want to work at places that they like. And everyone always thinks the grass is greener. Um, and, uh, you know, our head of engineering, Johnny, funnily enough, he left. After about 18 months, he said, I think that the people we've hired in engineering are old school. They're seeing agile as a noun. I'm, I'm out of here. And he's really young. He's incredible. He's like a racehorse you know, unbridled, right? And he wanted to invent, create, move at pace. And we took a step backwards when we hired someone who just had grown up in a mature tech environment and was bringing a lot of structure that, as opposed to just kind of much more risky experimentation. And then he came back because actually it wasn't so great on the other side. And uh, 
you know, it's very expensive to the business to just churn through people. So how do you think about holistically, what does it look, what would it do to the business if we could spend less on the whole process of, you know, in and out, managing, et cetera? Um, How do we get to a point where in retail, for instance, we never need to hire a manager again because we can see that talent. They love what they see. They're seeing more stable teams. They see the freedom to grow, you know, AI that gives people agency. It's not for the HR. I think that's the key mantra is you've got to use AI in a way that gives the individual agency. It's not for your HR function. It's going to be quite a big impact on frontline workers. Say more. In in terms of one of the challenges you just mentioned retail it just sparked mm. in my brain of uh, how companies show up for their frontline workers yeah and now using a similar way to be able to connect via a mobile app for example yeah. with the frontline workers using ai yeah absolutely and i think if 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 you could engage in a conversation and the business could see that you're someone that would be an incredible store manager and then they come to you and say hey we've got these openings you know this is all via chat and you know what you actually look pretty good in that area versus five people put their hand up you know across five stores right and and they may not be the best people but they're kind of sitting here in front of you so let's go with that or else can't be bothered we're going to go and hire externally a lot of people say it's easier to hire externally than it is to find internally and that changes your culture in a fundamental way um you know i think the fact that you have something like gen ai and it's sort of learning at your fingertips i remember when i was a chro i invested in linda Mm -hmm. and the idea was um just give people access and they'll go and do it. But you know what? I don't think people have time. I'd rather actually have a conversation prompted by the chat that says, you know, you know, Chris, you'd be really good at this if you thought about that. Shall we have a conversation here and I can help you better understand your strengths, guide you through that process, you know, the AI career bot. Um, Like, wow, what would that feel like? Because you know what? Your manager's probably shit. Your manager doesn't know you, doesn't have any time. You know, people join organizations, they leave managers. So suddenly you've got this augmentation of the whole manager experience coming through chat like that that's incredible so uh, you know and that's very human right what's not human is not getting anything zero which is yeah no reply whatsoever and also to your point it's probably prompting things that you never even thought about opportunities you never thought about uh, making connections around skills that you have that could are transferable to a completely different role that you never even would have thought yeah. about if it wasn't prompted yeah to as well so yeah. it's going to be powered by all of that data to be able to make those suggestions but, but also the other thing i think where we want to go right into the employee journey right so imagine that you just say you know forward slash and slack or teams help me learn the chat immediately goes and has conversations because you're integrated into workday with your peers your you know it reports comes back and they're going to be more honest because they're not saying it to your face and it can have the intelligence of probing like tell me more i'd love to learn about that because again most managers don't have the capacity or the skills to do that that's a hard thing for the individual to give upward feedback now you're getting back something in you know maybe it's a couple of days because you need people to have time you're you're getting summary how your peer group really sees you as awesome as this and this is an area to dive deeper would you like me to give you some tips so everything's controlled by the individual and it's it's ai that gives you agency and then you say to the person who's given the feedback hey would you like us to delete this data in the system or do you want to hold on to it in some way no, no doubt people say delete it, right? So the full control is in the hands of the individual. Truly empowered. Because mm. normally in many careers, especially in my early career, it felt like I was just like waiting for someone to give me permission to succeed. Yeah. And, that's, a, know, that's a great blog, blog title. You should write that story. Oh, permission to succeed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It felt like that. You know, I was just sitting there waiting for a tap on the shoulder for that promotion. Mm. I never, ever felt it. I never, for any point in those 10 years, felt empowered. Mm. I was truly in charge of my yeah. career and my yeah and look you know you, you, no one's going to discover you right like those people in my team even you know we say your career is your responsibility mm. um, you own it and uh, you know I, I, I used to think that I someone would notice yeah. I'm working really hard and I'm really talented but you, you, it never happens yeah so I think anything where you can really give people the power to to know themselves and to learn um, in a scalable way that is delivered through natural language is is very significant change in the way that we think about work. Yeah. Listen, I could talk to you forever. We originally- were, I know, I feel like we've got a bit beyond- We've gone way more than half an hour, but I was enjoying it so much. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to stop. Uh, before I let you go, like we've covered so much. If there's like one thing you want to leave the audience with, put sort of parting piece of advice, um, what, what would that be? And then where can people connect with you and learn more about Sapia. Yeah, so I think if you're a CHR, you know, you're in a leadership role, so lead on the on the journey um, before 
you know, your team are probably three steps ahead of you already. Where can people find more? Look, I, I, um, I, do, I, I don't go on Twitter, but I'm on LinkedIn a lot. And uh, I have a newsletter where I tend to just speak from my, you know, speak what's on my mind. And, and I, I think I like to be a bit of a provocateur to the industry. And um, so that's a good place to yeah. stay in touch with me. And, um, and then we have, you know, some really great starting books for you and your team that are not about us. They're about what do you do in this world of AI? You know, start that learning journey. Amazing. And for everyone listening, as always, those links are below. <laughs> Check out the newsletter. Uh, we'll also probably grab, if we could grab some of those books, ebooks. Yeah, yeah. Down below. Absolutely. I've grabbed there. But I appreciate you coming. It was really nice to meet you in person. Likewise. I appreciate your candidness. I appreciate you sharing your insights and joining with everyone here. Um, <laughs> we're all on this journey together. It's just changing. It's, it's so fast paced yeah. that honestly, many of the people are listening, it's, it's hard to keep up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as well so. yeah yeah and just but you just got to get in there you know like you said what's on the other side of yeah. facing into a fears you know not much probably empowerment and and curiosity being sparked love that i wish you all the best until we next week cheers